So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we are looking at Mrs. Challoway by Virginia Woolf. So in this section we will take a look at certain uh, selected passages from the novel. We uh, will sp place special focus on these passages and connect those passages to some of the broader issues which we have dealt with already in this novel. So one of the interesting characters in Mrs. Challoway is someone called Peter Walsh and we are told about Peter Walsh that he had been a former lover of Clarissa Dalloway who is a protagonist, the notional protagonist of this novel and Peter Walsh of course has spent a lot of time in India, uh, the colony of India and now is back to Britain and this is after the first world war and he finds himself in, a, in, in London that he cannot recognize anymore, that he cannot in integrate anymore. Uh, so in some sense Peter Walsh represents uh, the sort of the end of the empire, the ending empire so to speak because as you know that this is also a time where the English imperialism and the evils of English imperialism uh, were sort of coming to an end. The First World War had essentially made Britain uh, bankrupt and the Second World War completed the process entirely. So by the time the Second World War ended, uh, Britain's colonies were more or less freed because Britain could not manage the colonies anymore. It was becoming a bad business for them. Now Walsh, we are told that you know he, he has been various things and he's also been a bit of a failure because he had doubled in a series of things without being anything in, in, in its entirety. Now and this is a passage that we will see in some in some sense it will, it is an aspirational passage. It sees Peter Walsh, uh, as, uh, Peter Walsh aspiring to be something that he, he has not been able to achieve in his life and it is also a very interesting scene uh, from the perspective of masculinity studies because it shows him as an old, enervated, exhausted, disillusioned man. Uh, gazing at uh, young men who are sort of setting out to be the empire builders and he is looking at them from a cynical position, from a position of exhaustion, from a position of dissolution. Uh, so this is the passage which we should study in some details and this should be on your screen. Uh, he had been a socialist in some sense of failure, true. Still the future of civilization lies, he thought, in the hands of young men like that. So he's looking at the young men coming down uh, in London and they were sort of marching, presumably boy scouts marching down the streets of London. So the, the future of civilization lies, he thought, in the hands of young men like that, of young men that, such as he was 30 years ago with the love of abstract principles, getting books sent out to them all the way from London to a peak in the Himalayas, reading science, reading philosophy. The future lies in the hands of young men like that, he thought. So again, it's very masculinist kind of gaze at civilization where civilization is something which can only be controlled and manned essentially by young men. It's something that he retains from his, from his life in the colonies and we also told that he had been a socialist at some point which is obviously quite absurd and bizarre because being a socialist has also been the part of the empire building process. So in that sense one can make some interesting connection between Peter Walsh, the, the fictional figure of Peter Walsh and let us say a more historical and more real figures such as George Orwell uh, who had also been a socialist at some point but uh, I mean he had been a socialist throughout but he had also been uh, essentially an agent of the empire. He had been someone who was stationed in Burma uh, as some of you would know and he had also been instrumental in the empire machinery in, in some sense. So socialism and the empire location they go hand in hand, uh, notionally they are opposites of each other but that also tells you something about the socialism in Britain at that point of time. And also the very masculinist idea of socialism and you know, it is about all about young men uh, staying in the Himalayas, reading books sent to them, reading books about science, reading books about philosophy. So the entire notion of knowledge, the entire notion of civilization is very, very masculinist uh, and that, that masculinist gaze by Peter Walsh is something that we are seeing over here and that is obviously being critiqued uh, and we see the same masculinist gaze uh, in terms of medical science in, in the figures of let's say Holmes and Bradshaw, the two figures, the two medical figures in this novel, they also have, they also embody the masculinist gaze of the empire, the masculinist gaze of proportion, classification, control and coercion. So everything must have a proportion, everything must have a classification, everything must be classifiable, everything must be coercive, everything must be coerced into something. Uh, so you know that becomes part of the masculinist framework. Okay, a patter like the patter of leaves in a wood came from behind and with it a rustling regular thudding sound which as it overtook him drummed his thoughts, strict in step up Whitehall, uh, Whitehall without, without his doing. Boys in uniform carrying guns marched with the eyes ahead of them, marched their arms stiff 
and on the expression, on the faces and expression like the letters of a legend written down the base of a statue praising duty, gratitude, fidelity, love of England. Right. So again, uh, we see this very, very hyper-nationalist, uh, hyper-masculinist kind of uh, nationalism where all the young boys marching down to his white home wearing a uniform and also wearing an expression on the faces which uh, uh, which smoke, which which is sort of smacking philosophy, uh, gratitude, uh, fidelity, and nationalism. So everything put together and made them into some kind of ideal uh, march of masculinity that Peter Walsh is watching and observing with with you know, admiration from a distance. It is thought Peter Walsh beginning to keep step with them a very fine training, but they did not look robust. They were weedy for the most part. Boys of sixteen who might tomorrow stand behind bowls of rice cakes of soap and counters, now the war on them unmixed with sensual pleasure or daily preoccupations, the solemnity of the red which they had fetched from the Finsbury pavement to the empty tomb. They had taken the vow, the traffic respected it, vans were stopped. Now what this novel does, it, it just gives you these pictures of masculinity, these embodiments of masculinity and then deconstruct. Uh, deconstructs uh, those models uh, and it sort of exposes to you, uh, us readers, the fragility of these constructs. So we can see the fragility, even the uh, the very masculinist um, uh, spectacle that Peter Walsh is experiencing of these boys in uniform. Uh, but at the same time, if you look closely enough, uh, Peter Walsh realizes that they don't do not look robust or something fragile, or something weedy, something tired, something uh, uh, undernourished, or malnourished about these boys. And uh, also look at the way in which the whole idea of sensual pleasure uh, is seen to be a corrupting influence. So, you know, it is very essentially saying that, you know, the, uh, the touch of the female is a contamination, the touch of marriage is a contamination. So, these boys who are presumably virgin, presumably people who have not had the uh, contamination of sensual pleasures, they are still ideal men, they are still ideal boys who are not uh, sort of fallen into domesticity, fallen into, uh, you know, marriage, fallen into do domestic duties which are all seen as, uh, you know, effects of, uh, you know, feminizing influences which make the boys effeminate and weak. So again, the whole gaze is very, very uh, masculine and very offensively patriarchal in that sense. The whole idea of this big, strong, uh, fresh, virgin boys, uh, you know, untouched by marriage, untouched by the woman is something which was celebrated. Uh, this is very much part of the Boy Scout package that we saw uh, as, you know, informing the masculinity of the empire and that is something which Peter Walsh is experiencing over here with admiration but also with a degree of concern. Okay, I can't keep up with them, Peter Walsh thought as he marched up Whitehall and sure enough on the march passed him, uh, passed everyone in a steady way as if, as if one will walk legs and arms uniformly and life with its varieties with its uh, irreticences had been laid under a pavement of monuments and reds and dropped into a stiff yet staring corpse by discipline, right. So again the whole idea of uh, something uh, sepulchral, uh, sepulchral or corpse-like uh, is something which is suggested by this discipline. So there is something morbid about this discipline, it is not entirely uh, something which is celebrated and celebratory, there is something also morbid about it as well. Uh, and the whole idea of the legs and arms marching uniformly as one organism, what it also proves, what it also shows quite spectacularly is a lack of agency of any individual. So no individual can break the march, no individual can break the routine, can break the order. Right, so everyone's marching together as one organism, as one body, and that embodiment of masculinity as a as a spectacle is important for us. Okay, uh, there they go. One had to respect it. One might laugh, but one had to respect it. He thought. There they go. Thought Peter Walsh, posing at the edge of the pavement, and all the exalted statues, Nelson, Gordon, Havelock, the black, the spectacular images of great soldiers, stood looking ahead of them as if uh, they too had made some renunciation. Peter Walsh felt. Uh, Peter Walsh felt he too had made it the great renunciation, trampled under the same temptations and achieved at length a marble stair. By the stair Peter Walsh did not want for himself in the least, though he could not respect it, though he could respect it in others. He could respect it in boys, they don't show the, they don't know the troubles of the flesh yet. He thought as the marching boys disappeared in the direction of the strand, all that had been true, he thought, crossing the road and standing on a Gordon statue. Gordon, whom as a boy he had worshipped, Gordon standing lonely with one leg raised on his arms crossed. Poor Gordon, he thought. Okay, now what we see obviously is a gaze of cynicism. So he is someone who is just returned from the colonies and it is a bit like 
Marlow in Heart of Darkness, right? He's come back with the knowledge of nothingness. He's come back with the knowledge of disillusionment and it's looking at the boys who obviously don't have the knowledge yet, who are still very idealistic and it's looking at them with admiration but also a degree of pity, uh, also a degree of uh, you know concern because you know and again the, the very masculinist thing is important for us to understand uh, you know the whole idea of uh, these boys being contaminated by the flesh and flesh of course is feminine and flesh is, of course is contaminating uh, and that's something which is going against the masculinist, the pure manly model that uh, he's admiring uh, and also all these different figures mentioned Nelson, Gordon, uh, Havelock, the great soldiers of the empire so to speak. Uh, so they, they become the signifiers of masculinity, of the empire masculinity which Peter Walsh is trying to emulate. But also while he's also emulating it, he's also concerned, he's also completely aware on the fact that this is a completely uh, a, an experience of disillusionment, that he's going to be disillusioned at some point and he knows these boys that he's watching now will also be disillusioned. So he's like, it's like two different time zones looking at each other. So the boys are what Peter Walsh used to be 30 years ago. Uh, they also respect uh, Gordon, that's the way he used to be 30 years ago, right? And that kind of a uh, gaze from one temporal order to another temporal order is something which is very symbolic in this particular scene. But he's also someone, Peter Walsh, he's also someone who's been through it and has been through the entire experience of being disillusioned. And now he's come back as a cynical man, a fragmented man, uh, a completely alienated man and he cannot connect himself with the metropolis as such, okay. And this is what we saw, uh, what we see uh, right away in the, in the passage following. Uh, and just because nobody yet knew he was in London except Clarissa and the earth after the voyage still seemed an island to him. The strangeness of standing alone, alive, unknown at half past eleven in Trafalgar Square overcame him. What is it? Where am I? And why, after all, does one do it? He thought. The divorce seeming all moonshine and down his mind went flush as a marsh, uh, went flat as a marsh and three great emotions bowl over him, understanding a vast philosophy, a vast philanthropy and finally, as with the result of the others, an irrepressible, exquisite delight. As if inside his brain by another hand, strings were pulled, shutters moved and he having nothing to do with it, yet stood with the opening of endless avenues down which, if he chose, he might wander. He had not felt so young for years. Now, it's obviously a very interesting alchemy of emotions at play because on the one hand, uh, there is a degree of alienation and existential alienation where he's asking these very fundamental questions. What is it? Where am I? And you know, why does one do it? So, what, why take the trouble of going through the entire empire process and come back if that renders you so hollow in the end, right? So, again, this is where uh, he's a bit comparable with the Marlow figure in Heart of Darkness. But at the same time, now that he's back in the colonies, now that he's back in the metropolis, uh, he seems he experiences a sudden flash uh, of uh, happiness and this flush of happiness, this flash of knowledge is something which makes him elevated. And he said, oh yeah, he had not felt so young uh, for, so, for so many years. You know, so this is something which is making him uh, very, very young. Uh, coming back to um, the whole idea of uh, London. Uh, but at the same time, this is a very deceptive happiness as you can see because he's also feeling very alienated. He's also very, very disconnected with the realities around him and he's almost like a stranger and so the whole, his own experience of London, his whole knowledge of London has been essentially de-territorialized, right? So this de-territorialization of London is something which he's experiencing, this defamiliarization of London is something which he's experiencing over here. Okay, so what we should do as readers of Mrs. Dalloway is that we should make these connections between all these returning figures, Peter Walsh and Septimus Smith. They obviously return from two different zones. Peter Walsh is coming back from the colonies, he's not traumatized in a way that Septimus Smith is, but there is a degree of disconnect that he too faces. The degree of disconnect is obviously lesser compared to Septimus because Septimus also has a very medical situation, a very, uh, you know, cognitive situation uh, which is informed by trauma, his repeated experiences and encounters with trauma and guilt and survivor's guilt and, you know, the whole experience of violence that he's had in the trenches, which is obviously uh, much more than Peter Walsh in terms of the horror, but there is a degree of hollowness in both these characters which are, which is comparable. So, they are both essentially hollowed out characters, okay, and that is something which we must pay, uh, you know, some attention to, okay. Okay, so now we come to the uh, other section, we we'll skip a little bit and we come to again Lucretia and, and, and Septimus and look at the other kind of alienation that they are facing because we have already spoken about how Lucretia Smith, um, who is obviously Italian, 
as she feels like an outsider to London, in London. And Septimus is also an outsider because of his trauma. So there's a di different degrees of outsiderness that we see being experienced across this metropolis. Okay. Uh, and of course, Lucretia uh, Warren Smith was saying to herself, this should be on the screen, it's wicked. Why should I suffer? She was asking as she walked down the broad path. No, I can't stand it any longer, she was saying, having left Septimus, who wasn't Septimus any longer, to say hard, cruel, wicked things, to talk to himself, to, to talk to a dead man on a seat over there, when the child ran full tilt into her, fell flat and burst out crying. So, you know, this whole idea of not being a mother is obviously uh, something that she has consumed as part of a womanhood and that's making her um, even more uh, it's affecting her in a very adverse way, uh, you know, and she sees children around her and she has a dead husband in front of her. And the deadness of uh, Septimus um, is very, very interesting because obviously he's a hollowed out man. He's not the same man as he used to be, right? And this whole idea of being a different person is something which is uh, very cognitive at the same time almost medical and existential. This is medical existential quality about Septimus's difference as a person. Okay. so. Uh, but for herself, she had done nothing wrong. She had loved Septimus. She had been happy. She had had a beautiful home. And there were sisters left still making hats. Why should she suffer? And so the word she comes with, with capital letters over here. So the whole injustice of suffering is being uh, dramatized over here. Why should Lagrasia suffer? She did not plan the war. She did not orchestrate the war. She did not intend the war. So why should she suffer the war because of what's happened to her husband? Okay. Uh, And then we come uh, to, the, to the image of Septimus, and Septimus uh, obviously has been advocated, has been advised to think outside of himself by uh, Dr. Holmes and Bradshaw, because they look at Septimus's uh, you know alienation as a result of morbid introspection, right? Something the fact that he introspects all the time, he thinks all the time, he overthinks all the time, and there's doctors advising him not to think too much, but to play games, to play cricket, play outdoor games, play collective games to make him feel better, uh, to make him feel more connected to the world around him. Okay. So, she must go back again to Septimus since it was almost time for them to go to be going to Sir William Bradshaw. Sir William Bradshaw or Sir William Bradshaw, the knighted uh, doctor, is someone uh, who is obviously embodying the merciless masculinist medicine uh, or the masculinist medical gaze in Mrs. Dalloway to which Virginia Woolf herself was subjected to uh, by someone called George Savage, some of you know, uh, who confined Virginia Woolf uh, and you know, gave her this confinement treatment. Uh, she was not allowed to leave the house and she was fed. Um, you know, meals of milk and bananas to, to make her gain weight and everything was very, very coercive in quality and the whole idea of you know, confining the woman at home and giving her a diet to make it put on weight. So, she draws quite heavily, um, evidently she is drawing very heavily from her uh, experiences with doctors uh, you know, and William Bradshaw and Holmes, so, uh, uh, they are extensions of that uh, example, that experience that she herself had had. She must go back and tell him to go back to him sitting there on the green chair under the tree talking to himself or to the dead man Evans whom she had only seen once for a moment in the shop. He had seemed a nice quiet man a great friend of Septimus's and he had been killed in the war. But such things happen to everyone. Everyone has friends who are killed in the war. Everyone gives up something when they marry. She had given up her home. She had come to live here uh, in this awful city. But Septimus let himself think about horrible things as she could do if she tried. He had grown stranger and stranger. He said people were talking behind the bedroom walls. So, we have a very good example of the female alienation over here because the whole focus seems to be on Septimus because he's a suffering soldier. He's someone who's been traumatized by the war. But she keeps asking the question, everything, everyone loses something to the war. Everyone uh, has friends who are, you know, killed in the war. And, and the whole idea of having Septimus as this person who is somehow more entitled to his trauma because he suffers it and he had friends who got killed in the war is something that she finds very, very unfair. So, you know, we have different degrees of um, alienation, different degrees of existential isolation in Mrs. Dalloway. And the whole masculinist quality which has been critiqued uh, and is the, the critique is also extended to the whole negotiation with trauma, the whole negotiation with suffering. Somehow Septimus' suffering seems to be more noble rather than um, compared to uh, raise your suffering and that is something that she finds very, very unfair. Why should his suffering be more noble? Why should his suffering be more glamorous in that sense? Why should his suffering deserve more attention? Why can't he move on just like everyone else? Because she too has left behind several things. She too has suffered from the war but she's making an attempt to move on. So why 
why can't he? So there's very pertinent questions, uh, questions about fairness and unfairness, especially as a wife who's so wrong at so many levels, is something that is given voice to in this particular passage. Okay. Uh, And th when they got back, he could hardly walk. He lay on the sofa and made her told his ha hold his hand to prevent him from falling down. Down, he cried, into the flames. Uh, and he saw faces laughing at him, calling him horrible, disgusting names from the walls, and hands pointing around the screen. Yet they were quite alone. But he began to talk aloud, answering people, arguing, laughing, crying, getting very excited, and making her write things down. Perfect nonsense it was about death, about Miss Isabel Paul. She could stand it no longer. She would go back. So we we'll stop at this point today, and the whole point is, uh, Rezia Smith uh, finds this is like enough that she can take, more than others she can take, and she finds it very, very unfair. And uh, as I keep mentioning, the different degrees of dislocation, Peter Walsh is dislocated, uh, Septimus is dislocated, Rezia is dislocated, Clarissa Dalloway, who is supposed to be in the heart of the city as a white British woman, she too feels alienated. So this entire novel about different networks, different experiences of alienation, and Rezia's alienation is obviously manifold because First of all, she's Italian. Uh, she sacrificed everything to come to London. She cannot connect to it anymore. And secondly, she's married to this man who is a perennial sufferer, who is a traumatophilic, according to her. And she's, she finds it very, very unfair that he's the one who's suffering all the time and he refuses to see her suffering. And now this resolution to go back uh, is something that is in, that's dramatized, that's articulated over here. And she finds the entire idea of suffering, by suffering all the time exhausting for her to take. So different levels of exhaustion and innovation and dislocation, Mrs. Chalaway. And we'll just continue with this and hopefully wind up the next couple of lectures. We'll stop at this point today and we'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.